Um, hi, I'm Michael. I work for IBM. Um, so, and I'm going to talk a bit today about the Go compiler and uh, essentially how to implement an optimization or a simple optimization in the Go compiler. Um, so, one of the advantages of being open source, you can just go in and make your optimization and make everything go faster. Right. So, um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about me and the work I do at IBM. Um, and then I'll talk about the Go compiler, the compilation process that we go through when we take our source code and turn it into a binary. I'll talk about some tools and how we get set up to uh, work on the compiler. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the single static assignment backend. Static single assignment, I always get the wrong way around. Um, and that's really uh, a new thing that came in in Go 1.7 and makes everything a lot easier, so that's where I'm going to implement or optimization rule um, because it's much easier than anywhere else. Um, so yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, so I'm part of the Linux and IBM Z open source ecosystem team, which is a bit of a mouthful. But essentially, just means I work on uh, porting and getting projects, open source projects, to work on IBM Z hardware. Um, and these are some of the projects I've worked on. If you find me in the pub later, we can moan about them together. Um, Okay, <coughs> so uh, the platform that I work on is called IBM Linux One. It's kind of an umbrella marketing term for Linux and IBM Z hardware. Um, and it runs enterprise Linux from the usual people, Red Hat, Suzy, Ubuntu. Um, there's also Debian doing open source side of things, like Suzy, I think, as well. And um, yeah, we've got Go running on the platform, Docker, Kubernetes. And all you need to do, and this would be really helpful if you can try this out with your programs, <laughs> is to cross compile. You can just use this uh, go arch equals s from IGX, go os equals Linux, go build, and it will build a binary for this platform. So, um, yeah, if you're ever working on things that need to be portable, you can just you change the architecture and stuff, and you'll be, see if your work, work compiles properly on different architectures. Um, so, this is the kind of flagship, I would say, uh, platform for IBM Z. Um, so I just want to give you a flavor of like what, what it is. Um, it's a, essentially designed for business critical applications. So there's big caches, huge amounts of RAM, fully redundant RAM, so if something fails, it just keeps running and you can then swap it out later. Uh, maximum system kind of 170 cores, 32 terabytes of rain protected RAM, and something like 320, uh, usually like 10 G Ethernet cards. Um, and these are, this is the sort of hardware that, when you use a credit card, it will go through a machine like this. Um, so the latest one has uh, some crypto stuff, which is also quite cool, and that's all usable from Go, which is nice. Well, not the TRNG stuff, but the ASGCM and SHA-3 uh, are all open sourced and up there. So anyway, enough about that. Um, so what does the compiler do? Well, it takes source code. First of all, do some processing on that source code, um, try and turn it into a form that the machine can understand, so that's tokenizing it, parsing it. Um, then uh, at some point it does some error checking, type checking, making sure that it's a valid program. And obviously my might error out that point and say, no, you've, I don't know, left out a keyword or a semicolon or something. Um, and that's what we call the front end of the compiler. And I'm not really going to talk much more about the front end of the compiler because I don't really understand it. It's very complicated, very convoluted, because <laughs> it has to represent all these different states that, that may, may not be a valid program. Um, has to, deal with all the different control type uh, constructs you can build in Go. So what we do is we take that front end code and we lower it. Um, so this lower AST, AST stands for the abstract syntax, abstract syntax tree, <coughs> which is just a name for the data structure that you used to carry around code. Um, and we lower that into the SSA backend form. Now, I'm not going to talk much about what SSA is other than 
how it works in practice. But um, if you let some other talks, I'll end at the end and I'll tell you a bit more about what SSA is in theory. Um, and then once you've got it into that nice regular form, we can then perform a bunch of optimizations on it. And then finally, we take our uh, abstract kind of uh, data structures that we have in the compiler and we use it to generate instructions that we send to an object file and then we can then link that into our binary later. So that's kind of how the compiler works. So the rest of the time we're going to focus on this back end a bit. So what do we need to do to work on the compiler? Well, uh, the first thing I wanted to show you was go SSA func. Now, how, how many of you have used or seen go SSA func before? Wow. I, oh, <laughs> Paul has. There you go. Great. Um, so, um, well, at least I'm not telling you anything you uh, already know. Um, so this is kind of really a tool for compilers, engineers, but I find it really useful. I've worked on a few uh, optimization uh, projects within the standard library and things, and um, it's really useful for understanding on what your program is doing, or how, what, how, what the compiler is doing to your program. Um, so here we have the command line you use, and what I'm going to do is I'll just show you it in practice. Let's see if... Uh, we... Okay. Now, I'll try and type like this. Um, okay. So, let's... <laughs> Okay, so I have a program here called, uh, there we go, that's better. Um, so I have a program here which I've called BCE. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That looks like he's gonna go again. <laughs> well, maybe just talk loudly. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a simple program I made. It just reads um, two bytes from a slice and returns them combined into a UN16 in um, little endian byte format. Now, what we can do here is if we go go SSA func equals the name of our function. So here we have read uint16. So when we do go uh, tool compile uh, bc.go, yeah. hopefully that'll work. Oh, I'm using the wrong version of the compiler. Okay. Um, Uh, okay, so then we can open this ssa.html file that it's produced. And this is kind of like a, an HTML representation of what the compiler does to your program. So if we start on the left, you can see we have the source code. And then it goes through the phase where it generates this AST. And it's, I don't know, it's madness. Um, then it ends up in this beautiful SSA format. And all the rest of this file is really, I mean, it's not really focused on the front end, it's all fo focused on SSA, is all the different phases the compiler goes through as it compiles your code. So it does things like file elimination, which we'll talk about a bit later, dead code elimination, so if you've got some code that's just optimized, can be optimized away at, uh, at compile time, um, things like common sub-expression elimination, if you've got plus five in two different places, it can just do plus five once. Um, things like soft float, all this kind of stuff. So, and then all the way over here somewhere, um, you end up with some assembly file, uh, assembly code for your function. So if we go back to our source code, so we've got two, um, reads from memory here, this one x and y. 
And in our assembler, you see we've got two calls to panic here. Um, so essentially this is because there's a bounds check on each one of these uh, accesses. So what we can do here is, if I is we could add a little um, bounds checking hint to this code. And then compile it again. And then we'll open that up again. And now you see, well, even though we've added more code to this, this function, we've actually reduced the number of times it can panic because the compiler's worked out that once it's got past that first line, it can't panic at the other two lines, so it only needs to panic once. So there's actually only one bounds check in here now. Um, so this is a sort of cool thing that you can use this for. It's useful if you're implementing algorithms and things, sometimes it's tight loops. Um, so I, I used it a lot when I was working on uh, CharCharR20. Um, this is just, sometimes these bound checks, they all add up to slowing down the code a lot, and often they're just not necessary. Okay, so, so that's go as a safe hunk. Um, the other thing you need to know about when you're working on the compiler is how to build the compiler. Luckily, that's relatively straightforward. Um, so we can just, I've already checked it out, so it takes too long. Um, so we just run make.bash, and it will go away and it'll build the compiler for us. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the SSA backend itself and what it's doing and how it's structured. So really all it is, is um, all, all, all the sort of the SSA graph representation of your program is, is just a bunch of value structs pointing to other value structs. Um, and it's a, each value struct is a node in the SSA graph and it consists of the operation like add or shift or call a function or whatever. Um, some properties associated with that operation and also a list of arguments. So if you're adding, you might have two arguments and uh, you add them together and then out pops your answer. So inside the compiler, it would compile down and add into something like this, a node with um, some inputs and then producing an output. And we can build this up so we could add another add node and replace one of the inputs with it um, and build up graphs this way. So uh, essentially, if, you, if this was your program, your program would unconditionally add um, x plus 2 times y, I guess. As well as uh, arguments, we also have properties. So we can have, for example, what we call an aux int. And all this is kind of subject to change in detail, but it does help uh, explain some of the things you'll see when we look at the optimization rules later. Um, so these are just properties that might, the, the nodes might have. So for example, this uh, constant here, uh, constant node, has the property of two, which means it represents two. Um, so rather than being an input to the node, two isn't an input to the node, it's a property of the node in this case. Um, the aux value is mainly used for symbols and things. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And then uh, there's every node also has a type. So we, we keep track of all the types of all the nodes uh, as we're compiling your program uh, so that we have some idea of, um, usually it's to do with how we save out and restore when we're spilling uh, values. We need to know that information. Okay. Um, so this is great for kind of your standard arithmetic operations. You just run, build a bunch of nodes, put perform some inputs in, go through all different nodes, out comes your answer, great. Um, but real programs aren't really like that. Uh, they usually involve memory operations, reading from pointers, reading from arrays, writing to arrays, all this kind of stuff. So one thing you'll see scattered throughout the SSA uh, backend if you ever look at it is this mem uh, argument. So, and essentially this is just the way that the backend keeps track of the dependencies on previous memory states. So as we uh, write, for example, here we've got a store and another store, we need to make sure those two stores happen before we then do a load, because we might, that load might 
I mean, we, we don't know because the addresses might be the same. We might need to be able to load one of the, some of the information from one of those two stores. So um, this is kind of how we do that in graph form. So if you see mem, it, it, it just means this, um, basically. You just, it's just a way of linearizing uh, the memory accesses. Um, and this can be a bit of a pain if you're ever uh, trying to, to build optimizations on this stuff because we, because all the, the memory access is linearized, it's very, you don't get any nice properties around the dependence. So if, if something writes to a piece of memory over here and then writes to another piece of memory over here and then reads from this piece of memory again, you have to go back through your graph and see did I actually, did I overwrite that piece of memory? And it's, it's all very complicated. Um, so, so the optimizations around that area are actually pretty minimal, to be honest. Um, there is some basic store to low forwarding, some basic dead store analysis, but there's probably more that can be done around that area in the compiler. <clears throat> um, so one other thing I haven't talked about yet is sort of control flow in these types of graphs. And the way this is done is using phis. Um, so a phi node essentially combines different states, different possible states. And then we worry about how that actually gets turned into machine code later. But what we do is it means this could, for example, be an if statement. And in one branch of the if statement, it does two stores. And in the other, it doesn't do anything. So we, one might go through this past top path and do two stores and end up at this phi, or we might just go straight to that phi. And it's just a way of representing that this, uh, this value could be these two things, possibly. Um, okay. So now I thought we'd uh, just quickly try and write our own optimization rule. Um, so an optimization rule is essentially just a pattern matching uh, system. So we write a rule where we match, for example, this. Here we have a multiply on the left. Um, here it's multiplying by a constant two. So we can replace that with an add. So what this rule will do is just replace this multiply with an add. Um, and in our SSA uh, func thing, um, these rules get applied at this phase, the opt phase. And also, confusing, uh, also at the, wherever it is, the late opt phase. Um, good naming schemes. Uh, so yeah, so these sorts of optimizations for the generic, uh, for generic code are applied there. Um, and then we also have a separate set of optimization rules uh, for architecture specific code. So, what I'm going to do now is, this is the, the compiler. So if you check out the compiler, it looks like this um, in the source directory. And then we can go down into the compiler SSA backend. We have this file called gen. Uh, and this contains a bunch of rules files and some code generating uh, files. And what we can do is we can go into the generic rules. So we also have, uh, for example, these are the rules for the IBM Z platform. Um, these are the rules for the x86 platform. Um, but we're going to focus today on the generic rules, which is always the best place to put optimizations because then it helps everyone. Um, and what I thought we'd do uh, is we'd apply a constant optimization. So what I have if we go back up, do this a lot. <laughs> um, I've made us a little uh, test code. So let's open up. Here we have um, a very simple uh, benchmark, which basically wraps mass slash bits uh, dot len 64. So this just measures. Uh, the bit length of um, of a uh, value, essentially. So, the more um, the, the more zeros you have at the top end of the number, 
the, the shorter the bit length will be. Um, so in this case, I've just got it writing one, um, one, uh, one instance of len64, which is taking the input three, which has a bit length of two. Um, so let's, first of all, actually, before we do anything else, let's go and set our path. So we need to do this so that we're actually using the compiler we've just built as opposed to my system compiler, which is apparently a bit out of date. Uh, that's not right. Give me the desktop. No, it doesn't. Oh, there we go. Decided because it's plugged in. Um, back. All right. So, so now we are using the development version that we just built earlier. And we can use that to uh, build our code. So if we go... Hopefully, yay. Okay, so we just run our benchmark, um, which does this bit length um, uh, uh, execution. And we've got it at 1.56 nanoseconds per operation, which is quite fast. Um, but if we look at the code, we can see so we have one, one cool thing here, which is that the, the bit length uh, function has actually been turned into a uh, operation. So here we have, um, this is because it's actually an intrinsic in the compiler. So the compiler knows this function can be implemented with one instruction, in this case, uh, represented using the bit len 64 op. Um, but what you see is if you go all the way to the end, um, where is it? You should see, hopefully, I can't remember which one it is actually. Uh, uh, oh, it's because it's surrounded by some stuff. Um, sorry, my x86 assembly isn't very good. But basically, this is um, doing that bit length repeatedly in the loop. So, uh, but we know from our, from our source code back here that um, we're always passing it the input of three. So we know that the, the result should always be two. So what we can do is we can go into the compiler, hopefully. And we can add a new optimization rule, which takes our bit len 64 and takes a con 64 argument. So we'll give that the variable name C. And we'll constant propagate that constant through the bit length function using um, uh, a call to the actual function itself. So in this case, we'll do so sorry, it's it's pernickety about types. Um, so basically, what we've done is we've re replaced this bit len 64 op with a constant and the result of the bit len 64 op evaluation. So what we can then do oops, is we'll run the code generator. Uh, 
And this takes that rule and it turns it into a new rewrite uh, operation. So this is part of the graph pass that actually does applies all these optimizations. So this rule is just it's just fed into a, a Go code generator. So you can just look at the code and see what it's doing. And so here you can see, for example, it's setting the auxint value of our um, value. So hopefully, now what we can do is go back up here <laughs> and rebuild the compiler, which takes far too long. That's why you have to buy one of those big machines. Anyway. <laughs> so just as a reminder, so this, this is what the code looked like before. So we had this CMOV equal thing. Um, and then it's doing moving uh, the result into a sync. Still compiling, still find something else to talk about. Um, double, yeah. This is kind of cool actually, because this, um, when you build the compiler, it actually builds itself multiple times, just to make sure it's able to build itself and it's, it's uh, repeatedly building itself correctly. Um, nearly done. For comparison, if I was doing the, the Swift compiler, it would take about two hours to do this. <laughs> okay, perfect. So then, so we've still got our Go uh, development version. So we can go back up and we'll repeat our benchmark. And hopefully, see it's gone down from 1.6 nanoseconds or whatever, 0.4. So we can then look at the code again. Go all the way over to the right and you'll see uh, Should have should be saving three into the two, just saving two into the result. I don't know why it's not. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's going faster, so it's doing the right thing. It's just not printing the right thing. I guess that's what you get for trying to do this, in, not in advance. <laughs> um, anyway, so essentially, this should be showing. Actually, maybe it just needs refreshing. Maybe that's what it needs. No, nope. still saying that. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so this line will change to be saving three into the sink, uh, two into the sink, basically. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of how to uh, save a um, add an optimization rule to the compiler. Um, it's fun to play around with. If you want, if you're interested in these kind of things, <laughs> um, I quite like compilers, so I put ton of time on these things. But anyway, um, it's all open source, so you can just have a go. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks to the organisers. Do a great job of organising this every month. Um, and here are some extra links if you're interested in SSA and stuff. I highly recommend the Keith talk. Um, and then if you're interested in any of our stuff. Um, Bill and myself did some talks uh, about various things and assembly and stuff like that. So yeah, thank you very much for listening.